I'm Tim, one of the pastors here. I just want to thank you for being with us today as we've come to the presence of the Lord to worship. And uh, it's a special day today. As uh, many of you know, uh, we are commissioning our former youth director to now be commissioned as our youth pastor, Ben Upham. And uh, we've asked Rob Weissey from our district to come down and be with us for this morning to celebrate uh, Ben. Uh, Rob is uh, Forest Lakes Director of Family and Youth Ministries and Special Events. He's probably got the longest title of anybody in Forest Lakes District. So <laughs> thanks for coming here and to be with us, Rob. Come and share. Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be back at Toma. This is one of my favorite churches. Uh, I think there's a lot of reasons by that, but uh, it's just this is a warm, warm place to come. And uh, you guys had some snow last night. Thank you for putting me up in a hotel. I came down last night uh, before, so it was great. I bring greetings from the district office. And uh, I just want to turn your attention to a slide that tells you a little bit more about the Forest Lakes District and also the EFCA. You're part of something bigger. I don't know if you know that, but the EFCA uh, consists of 1,500 churches nationwide. In our district, we have 140 congregations approximately 35,000 worshipers. That's kind of a, 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 during COVID, interesting. We'll see what that looks like. Could be more, could be less, depending on, on how you track that. But we've got some ethnic and multi-ethnic uh, churches. We have church plants, 650 uh, par prayer partners. And the thing that I love about the Forest Lakes District is our goal is to come alongside of you and help you as a church, help your pastoral staff. So we talk about connecting, equipping, and multiplying. So thank you for the privilege of being here. I've been on staff for 17 years. They haven't thrown me off yet, the, the, the staff. And so it's grateful to be back uh, in Toma. Well, on behalf of the EFCA, the FLD staff, I want to affirm you as a congregation on your call of Ben Upham to be one of uh, now your youth ministry pastor. I remember uh, this day back in Wausau when I became their pastor. This lady ran up to me as fast as she could after the service. Rob, Rob, I'm so glad we get to call you a pastor now. And I'm like, okay, that's great. So it was kind of a big day for her. All I will say is, is we're all pastors and ministry leaders in some ways. But this is a special day because we charge our pastors to do something. And so, Ben, I'm going to talk to you first and let the congregation listen in. My charge to you is 1 Timothy 4, 12, and 13. It says, Paul assured Timothy as a younger man to let no one look down on you because you're young. And sometimes we feel intimidated because we're younger. We are unsure or possibly even fearful of a role in ministry. I remember when I became a pastor, all of a sudden I was like, oh, wow, I got to get spiritual now, as if I wasn't before. But there's this pressure sometimes we put on. The reality is, is this relationship with God is so important for us to cultivate and not be insecure about it. So the charge to you, Ben, is to set an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Preach and teach the scriptures, and don't neglect the gift. Watch your life and your doctrine. And that's a huge thing as we've watched ministry people around the United States watching their doctrine where they stand. Ben, in order for you to minister to people, you must be growing in the Lord. And that's such an important thing for you to remember. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of God dwell in you. And I hope that you will develop this discipline that I've worked on of listening to God. It's not an easy one. And figure out, how does God minister to you and refresh you? It's a, it's a word for all of us. How does God do that? Do you feel closer to God today than you did five years ago? It takes work for the Holy Spirit for us to listen to what God would be saying to us. A couple of other uh, charges, Ben, to you. Uh, love the people, Ben. Remember that people are more important than programs. Uh, also, your family is more important than ministry. Yes, I'm going to say that here. So prioritize your life with God, your family, and ministry. There's going to be seasons when ministry is very busy. And so you've got to figure out the schedule and all that. Also, the devil is real, and I want to remind you of that. He is after us in ministry. If he can knock out a pastor, uh, resist him in the power of the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ. Be accountable for ministry and personal health. Network for encouragement. I know you're already doing that. It's important for us to get together as ministry leaders and share best practices and resources because this is not the easiest thing to do always, ministry. Have we all figured that out during COVID? <laughs> 
When things get tough, Ben, this is the most important thing I can tell you. Remember your calling. I guarantee you, if you talk to Pastor Tim or, or Pastor Neil or other pastors, they'll tell you, man, if it wasn't for the call of God, I don't know if I'd still be here because things will get rough. Longevity has its advantages, and I will say that relationships really develop in that. And I also want to just encourage you that I'm here for you if you need to talk. You've got my cell phone number. I call it the red phone sometimes. We need those people just that we can call and run ideas. So now I want to charge the congregation with just some things real quick also. So now, Ben, this is your chance to listen in as I charge the congregation. So what is the role of a pastor in the local church? It's to do everything. No, I'm kidding. That's not the way it is. But in a lot of places, they think that. So Ephesians 4, if you read verses 11 to 16, his role and the pastor's role is to equip the saints, the believers, to use their gifts to serve the body of Christ and the community. It's to teach, coach, mentor, adults, students, volunteers, and leaders. And it doesn't say do all the ministry, but to encourage all of us to use our spiritual gifts that God has given to serve the body of Christ, the local church, and the community. So what can you as a congregation do for Pastor Ben? Here's some things that I would just give you. Pray for him weekly, uh, daily, and hourly. And pray for Whitney, too, because this is a partnership, and she's alongside him, and it's very important. It's not an easy job. I joke and say ministry is messy, isn't it, Tim? It's messy, but necessary. And the longer you're in this, you realize that God will use even the messy. Encourage and support Ben in his decisions as he leads. The Bible tells us so. One of my favorite things, Ben, is I developed an encouragement file because there's going to be those days that are discouraging. So when you get an encouraging note, by the way, if you can all send him encouraging notes, authentic, if you really believe he's doing a good job and you think he's, you know, <laughs> what I would say is send him notes of encouragement. He needs that. We all need that, especially during this COVID time. I've seen it be one of the hardest on pastors that I've ever seen. But take that encouragement file. There's going to be days, Ben, where you're going to have to go in there, pull that out because it's been a tough day. I also want to encourage you Matthew 18. If you have an issue with Ben, give him the Give them the benefit of the doubt and go talk to them. Most of the time, what I see in churches and around, people talk stuff around rather than going direct. And misunderstandings. I heard a story recently that my father-in-law told me about him and his brother-in-law. They didn't talk for 20 years. And I said, why? He said, well, he got offended because he walked by me and thought I didn't say hi to him. I said, how'd you rectify that? And he said, one day we looked at each other and said, what's the problem? He said, I don't know, but I think you ignored me at one time 20 years ago. And he goes, wow, I'm really sorry. And he goes, wow, let's be friends again. How sad. You think about that. So let's go directly to people if we have an issue. And, and if you can let something go, let it go. That's the other thing, especially during this time, we've seen a lot of divisiveness of people and different opinions. Affirm Ben and understand his gifts and abilities and don't compare him to f former youth pastors that were here. Parents, commit to getting yourself and your family to the weekly worship services, Sunday school, youth group, and remember your role in the family as parents is to be the primary spiritual provider. And we come alongside to help in that. We really, that's our goal. Get involved in the local church using your spiritual gift or gifts and volunteer your time for God. And this is one, of my, one that I think is quite interesting. You'll, you'll probably experience if you haven't yet. Remember when Ben is away at camps, retreats, conferences, or mission trips, or districts, don't ask him, hey, how was your vacation? We've heard that a few times. And lastly, help hold Ben accountable to take his day off each week and balance his priorities. Ben, have you figured out what your day off is yet? Can you tell us? Saturday. So help him keep that. Try not to bug them unless you have to. If it's an emergency, we understand that. And then I also want to encourage you to be asking Whitney, how's he doing on that? Are you getting date nights? Things like that, because that's important. Ben, would you come up? I'm going to start with you first. And um, I want to do the official commissioning from the EFCA. So this is going to be verbatim from them. Dear friends in Christ, guided by the Holy Spirit, you have called Ben Upham to be one of the pastors of this congregation. By this act, you have indicated your confidence in him to be one of the shepherds of this flock. Undergird him with your prayers. Assist and encourage him in his labors, which will be his in the service of God. Remember always that he is one of God's servants and that you as God's stewards are to supply his needs in a way that will be pleasing 
uh, to God and an honor to this congregation. In all these things, show him, your, his, show him your love, esteem him highly for his calling as one of the pastors, and accept him as one of your spiritual leaders. If these are your intentions, please support him and the continuing ministry of this church by standing at this time and responding to two questions for me. Will you receive Ben Upham to be one of your pastors, recognizing his place in spiritual leadership and receive the word of God through him? If this is your promise, answer, we will. Will you do your full part to supply his needs in a way that will be pleasing to God and will you encourage him and share with him in the work of Christ in this church? If this is your promise, answer, we will. Well, I want to present this uh, to Ben. This is like a first uh, that I've done. In 17 years, you think I'd have gotten smarter and done this earlier. So, the, the, yeah, this is not the rod. Or as I've given Tim, we, had this, um, we have this shepherd staff where we say, don't beat the sheep. You can't beat the sheep with the baton. But this as a baton signifying, Ben, your role of passing on the truths of God's word to the next generation, Psalm 78.4. So let this be a signif signification this, of, of what we would love to see you do uh, here at Bible EFCA. I'm, no, it's pretty, it's pretty thin, actually, so it's not real heavy. It's probably good, then you can't do anything with it. All right, I'm going to invite up the elders and Whitney and, and also the pastoral staff. We're going to pray over Ben and Whitney at this time and just commission them. All right, I'll start. Father in heaven, thank you for this day of celebration, this commissioning of Ben, and thank you for Whitney also, who's right there alongside of him. Thank you for how you've prepared them for this day. Thank you for the answered prayer of how he has been fulfilling this role already. And I pray that you would protect him, that you would guide him, that you would give him wisdom. May he be an influence with the students, their families, in the community. And we pray that you'd protect him, Lord, from the enemy. We thank you for this day. We ask for your blessing over him as we commission him. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for... Uh, this call and the example of provision that it is for for Ben and for Whitney, but also for our church. Um, thank you so much for the many gifts that you've bestowed upon Ben and the work the Holy Spirit's been doing in his ministry already and will continue to do. We pray um, for your hand of protection on Ben and on Whitney and for continued wisdom that you'll give uh, ben, as he follows this call. Thank you. Father, Father, thank you so much for Ben and Whitney for your call in their lives. Mm. And uh, what a blessing it is to me mm. and to our church. I pray that you would give Ben confidence in your gifting not in his abilities, but your provision for him. Thank you for the way that he has already influenced um, our staff, our leaders, our students especially. And we pray too for Whitney that you would give her wisdom and discernment as to her role in supporting Ben and listening and encouraging him, serving in the way that you have for her uh, behind the scenes. Uh, helping him. Give both of them confidence and joy. And we pray for a fruit that comes only by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. And then I have one more gift on behalf of our congregation, and we are grateful Thank you. for your accepting this call. You can be seated. Just a reminder, after the service, you're invited to a time of uh, dessert, cupcakes, and coffee.
down the hall to the left and then make your way back in the foyer. Just some time to say uh, hi again to, to Ben and to congratulate him and commit to s supporting him and praying for him and us as a church. If you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to Colossians. And um, as you're doing that, I just also just want to say um, one of the things that I'm, I am so grateful, as you can tell in our prayer, um, to, to the Lord for leading Ben to our church. And just the way that he led in the process a year and a half ago uh, for Ben to be available, to be an interim youth director part-time, and then transition to full-time, and then and now uh, having sensed God to to God's call to be a pastor, and we are, I'm so grateful for that. And I remember a year ago, we have our annual elder retreat, and we often say uh, praises and thanks and prayer requests, and I said, honestly, the number one thanksgiving I had a year ago was for Ben, for how God had led him to be a part of our church. And the transition from Pastor Paul to bringing Ben on staff has been an unbelievable blessing, and um, we have observed uh, several things about Ben, some of which are a little bit comical. Um, in fact, we have given him a gift card. We were talking about what kind of gift card to give him. We realized he is such an eccentric, thrifty shopper. You can't give him one gift card like from Amazon or something like that. It has to be more generic because he's going to find something specific that he wants to spend it on. But we hope he'll use it for books and that kind of thing. Uh, the other thing is Ben is a coffee geek. So if you haven't figured that out, um, our coffee will not be satisfactory for him, but you, it'll be good enough for you today. Uh, <clears throat> but seriously, uh, we have seen Ben's gifts in teaching and knowledge of the word. Uh, you students have seen that. Parents have seen that in his life. Um, ben is an idealist, sometimes a little bit too idealistic, but also I've seen the blend of what I would call prophetic discernment this insight to see what's going on and figure out how to speak God's word to those issues. And we have seen that Ben has, I've seen Ben has intuitive leadership gifts. You've seen that with the development of student leaders and with the development of our adult leadership team. And those of you who are in those roles have seen that in Ben's life. And we have also appreciate uh, that Ben and Whitney have our intentional about sharing their life and their hospitality with kids and adults. So um, th these are just some affirmations I want to make in your life, Ben, as you've accepted this call. As I was uh, thinking through uh, what to preach on today, it's, I can see the sovereignty of God in that we chose to have a series on Colossians as a staff. Uh, we started talking about this last summer. And looking at a passage that would fit this sort of um, occasion, I found notes from my Colossians file from like 30 years ago on the passage we're going to talk about today that I used 31 years ago on January 28th at my ordination service in this church. Not this building, but this church. From Colossians 1, uh, 24 to 29. Paul is inspired by God and explains what he's done for the church. Both what he's done for the church uh, in general, but in chapter 2 he moves into what he's done in specific for the church at Colossae. And so Paul has started out this book we've just been looking at for a couple weeks, and starts out, this is how I'm thanking God for you, first few verses. Then a long section in the middle of chapter 1, this is how I'm praying for you. We're going to come back to some of that next week. But then at the end of chapter 1, this is what I'm doing for you, or what I have done for you. Now the danger of, I think, talking about a passage like this and, and, and equating what we as pastors do with what Paul did, that's dangerous, because there's nobody like Paul. There were only a handful of apostles. We're not that. So there's danger in presuming that. And the other danger, I think, as we talk about pastoral leadership is making, and Rob kind of alluded to this, making this distinction between clergy, pastors, and laity, like there's some big gap uh, between those two roles. Because on the one hand, that can lead to an excessive honor, which leads to pride, which leads to other issues which we've seen play out in prominent leaders all over the world. And on the other hand, it can lead to a kind of a double-layered set of expectations 
that there are some expectations that are only for leaders, and there's a secondary level of expectations for followers. And it is an honorable calling to be a pastor. He says that in 1 Timothy 3. Anyone who sets his heart on being an overseer desires a noble task. And there are higher standards of character, this whole list of those in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. But the broader question I want us to think about as we kind of look into Paul's heart is, what is the universal calling of all disciples of Jesus Christ, regardless of your leadership, influence, or position? And I believe Paul, as he is talking about what he's done here to the church, for the church, and a group of people in Colossae who's never met, he's modeling some commitments of a pastoral and disciple-making ministry. And as we look at them, I want us all to kind of listen in and think through how am I living out these commitments in my everyday life as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And the first commitment is we are willing to suffer with Christ on behalf of his church. Paul says that in verse 24. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now, this is a kind of a difficult phrase there, to fill up what was still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. It doesn't mean that there's anything missing in what Christ's atoning sacrifice did on behalf of people being able to be made right with God. Uh, these sufferings are not what saves the church. That's not what Paul is saying. But they go along with the proclamation of the message, the living out of the message. And Paul sees his sufferings as in some way reducing the amount of suffering other believers will have to do until everything comes to an end. He says it like this in 2 Corinthians 4. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life, that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. So there's a sense in which uh, we as disciple makers and we as leaders are willing to suffer with Christ on behalf of his church. And this is not so much the idea of suffering like we think of death and physical trials and illness, but in the context of ministry, it is more suffering the reactions of other people and how they may misunderstand and jump to conclusions. Or how uh, kids you have invested in will fail and disappoint you. Or how close friends you thought were really good leadership friends betray you. Not to mention outright attacks on your character because of what you stand for. We are prepared to suffer with Christ on behalf of his people. But that doesn't mean it's easy. And sometimes it will be sad. And I'm reminded of the example of Jesus. When Paul is recounting what Jesus did, we often read this at communion service, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples. And who was included in the people that he was blessing? The one who would betray him. And that is our example. We are willing to suffer with Christ on behalf of his church. Second, we are stewarding the call of God to present the word of God in its fullness. I have become its servant, that is, the servant of the church, verse 25, by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, uh, to make the word of God fully known, is how the ESV translates it. So this is uh, fundamentally talking about the word of God. The historic cry of the Evangelical Free Church of America has been, where stands it written? Show me in the Bible. Now, there's several implications here. Number one, a pastor is a servant. I've become a servant of the church. Number two, a pastor has a unique calling. We've kind of emphasized that. In this case, this is this commission. And he has become a, uh, as the ESV translates, I've become a minister according to the stewardship from God. There's a kind of a different word there. And really what it's saying is that Paul has a role to administrate 
in explaining the plan, that is the new administration of God, as to how he's going to save the world through Jesus Christ. So presenting the word of God in its fullness means more than just preaching. It also means pursuing the fruit of life transformation when people believe and hear and obey. We saw that at the beginning of the chapter. That is bearing fruit and growing. But it's also the idea of this, so then it's also this idea of a missional component. When the word of God has been preached in its fullness, it keeps expanding and spreading. And so we are um, on a mission, the Great Commission, to make disciples of Jesus Christ, beginning in eastern Monroe County and then throughout the world. And that's part of preaching, that is part of stewarding the call of God to present the word of God in its fullness. But the core calling is not just the Bible, but it is more fundamental than that. It is the, the message of the Bible, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible is telling us about, the good news of Jesus Christ. And as a leader, as a teacher, there is constant pressure to add to the gospel or to reduce the gospel. And we'll see some of that as we continue our series in Colossians as to what's going on in the environment of that time. But a disciple-making pastor is fundamentally committed to preach the gospel, to present the word of God in its fullness, and to some extent, all of us have that responsibility. Third commitment focuses on really the essence of the fruit and the content of the gospel. And really, this is the heart of this passage. We are, as disciple-making leaders and individuals, with and through the church, revealing the mystery of God, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Notice what he says. We, I, 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 I'm, I'm become a servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. That is, verse 26, the mystery that has been kept hidden for, for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the saints. Remember the saints, that's a synonym for the church. It's not so much individual saints or emphasis on holiness as much as it is an emphasis on the body gathered. It's been revealed to the body, the church. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now this mystery thing can become kind of a mysterious process, but if you study it, mystery is really describing uh, some part of the plan of God that had been hidden, not yet revealed. And only by revelation of God can anybody know the secret, the mission, the mystery. The first really example of this is in Daniel 2.19, uh, 2, where he is asking God, please give us insight to the mystery of this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And Nebuchadnezzar is saying, somebody better tell me what my dream was and what it means, or heads are going to roll. And so Daniel's praying, Lord, tell us what it was. And God reveals the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, and now it's wide open out for everybody to know. In the same way, uh, we will be talking in the New Testament about the mystery of God. It is this mystery, Ephesians 3 puts it like this, that through the gospel, Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body. This mystery now has been made clear is how God's way of salvation is going to come throughout the world and be revealed to everybody. And it is through Christ. So the heart of the matter is this. What is the universal call for all disciples of Jesus? Your mission as a disciple of Jesus Christ is to make known the riches of the glory of the mystery of God, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we see an emphasis in that phrase that somehow Christ in us allows us to experience the glory of God. How is that possible? Only Christ in you. And, and, and we saw this a few weeks ago. Christ in you, that, that in Christ is the only source of hope. Not a vain wish, 
but a certain future in Christ alone. But the unique emphasis of Colossians to this mystery language is that he's saying the key to the Christian life is Christ in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is how you live the Christian life. Many years ago, um, Dan Spader, Rob, you're familiar with him, uh, was a teacher at Moody Bible Institute, trainer at Moody Bible Institute, and he founded a ministry called Sun Life Ministry. Uh, I was a, a part of the ground floor, first generation of youth ministries that were kind of their, his guinea pig in uh, northern suburbs of Chicago. And Dan Spader's vision in 1978, 79, somewhere in there, was to have 10,000 youth groups across North America who were committed to a disciple-making, sun-life philosophy ministry. And I, you, know, you can talk with Rob about this, too, but I would wager that you can trace back almost all of the emphasis on disciple-making in the last 40 years, at least in evangelical circles, to what happened in those years out of Moody Bible Institute. And the Sun Life principle comes from Colossians 1.27. We're going to what they call Youth Discipleship Institutes, YDIs, One Day Seminars. And one of them was Principles of Ministry. And there were four principles of ministry. And the fourth one was the Sun Life principle. Christ in you, the hope of glory. There are 170 references in some way, shape, or form to Christ in you, or being in Christ in the New Testament. And it all boiled down to this model, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So what, several implications of that phrase. Number one, the Christian life is intended to be simple. Christ in you. Not that it's easy or problem-free, but it means that you're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. It's very simple. And it's so simple that that's offensive to some people. And we see that. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In the world's viewpoint, complexity means wisdom. I saw this... Uh, liberal theologian was asked who Jesus is. And here was his answer. Christ is the omega point, the culmination of the cosmogenesis of cosmological experience. Jesus is the realization of the transitional being conceptualizing the efficacious existence of the consequent realization of physical actualities. Jesus came from God as the flux of primordial and permanent, permanence derivatives. Jesus is the hypothesis of the world. Does anybody understand that? In the world's eyes, wisdom sounds complicated. But it's not. It's Christ in you. Simple. But on the other hand, living the Christian life is impossible. Jesus also said in, in John 15, 5, Apart from me, you can do nothing. Which leads us then to that fundamental sun life principle, which could be also the big idea today, is that the Christian life is Christ in us and living his life through us. Very simple. And it will take a lifetime to learn. I saw this excerpt from a book by Jack Taylor called The Key to Triumphant Living. He said, once a person becomes a Christian, he's faced with one monstrous dilemma. He's supposed to live, love, walk, and talk like Christ. He's commanded to love his enemies, abstain from the very appearance of evil, and grow in grace. So we're to worry about nothing and be thankful for everything. We're ordered to rejoice always, deny ourselves, accept the fact of our death, and follow Christ every day of our lives. We are to set our affections on things above and not on things on earth. Add to these and dozens of other demands made on us, we are supposed to be of good comfort, cheerful, and kind in the midst of an unkind world. That's our dilemma. Paul reflected on it when he said, when I would do good, evil is still present with me. I can't do this life in myself. Later on he said, this is the simple secret to the Christian life. 
It is, in fact, so simple that millions miss it. There is a dynamic so mighty that no life can remain the same after discovering it. Paul called it a mystery which has been hid from the ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, Colossians 1.26. It is the secret, the key, the supreme dynamic, the glorious secret of the Christian life. I bless the day I began to see it. True Christianity is simply Christ in uity and Christ in meity. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We are committed to revealing with and through the church the mystery of God, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And last, we are working hard to proclaim Christ, empowered by Christ, to present everyone mature in Christ. Verse 28 and 29. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Now you know the goal, you notice there the goal is maturity. Some people have said, well, and sometimes it's translated make perfect, which is the NIV. Perfect is too strong, it implies perfection. Maturity may be a little bit too weak because it implies look around the room and find somebody that's behind you and then you're doing fine because you're just ahead of them. A better uh, idea is the Old Testament word blameless, which means, if you study it, a wholehearted devotion to the Lord, a whole life alignment to following the Lord. So perfect or being mature means the undivided way in which a disciple of Jesus, with positive and negatives, is still oriented toward Christ. That's the goal, making people more and more oriented toward Christ, more and more mature. You notice here that what he's saying here is being a disciple is for everyone. All, admonishing all, teaching everyone with all wisdom, all or everyone is repeated four times in that one verse. To emphasize the universality of being a disciple, that it's a one kind of calling. There's no two or three tiers of following Jesus. And there's no people that have uh, more secrets than others, which is a problem with Colossians. At the same time, this means our approach has to be customized to where individuals are at. We, our goal, is to present everyone, everyone under the span of our care, perfect in Christ. Which means we need to think through where are our individuals at and how do we approach them, how do we lead them, how do we call them to the next step in growth. So disciple-making ministry has programs to connect with unbelievers, helping them become committed and convinced by Jesus, committed to relationship with Jesus. It must have ministries that are committed to growing new believers so they are changed to be like him in the context of a commitment to loving relationships, often in the context of small groups or small networks. And a disciple ministry, making ministry has to have leadership equipping that is helping people live out their call to Christ's priorities, loving relationships the way the Lord modeled that, committed that kind of relationship. So it has to be custom fit to where different people are at because everyone is intended to be a disciple of Jesus. God wants us, all believers, live out these commitments to make disciples of Jesus in and through our relationships. So the challenge for all of us is to think through what action steps can you take to live these commitments out. To make disciples in the realm of the relationships you have been given. So think about the people in your circle of influence and define where they're at in relationship to God. Do they even have a relationship with God? How can you disciple them to the point where they want to believe? Where are they at? What do you need to do to interact with them? And then think through how might you have to suffer? for the sake of the body? How can you present the gospel, the word of God in its fullness, teaching, talking, living, a variety of ways? And you'll notice that Paul says he's proclaiming, he's admonishing, sometimes the admonishing is correcting, and the teaching is more preventative. 
And with other believers, how will we together model this principle, Christ in us, the hope of glory? You notice uh, there are a couple other implications of the last point. Not only is it for everyone, and maturity is the goal, and we have to have a custom-made approach, but it's hard work. Paul uses the term labor, which means you get tired, run out of energy. He uses the term struggling, which is an athletic term for getting into the fight and the battle and continuing, which means the only way you can do it is empowered by Christ. He piles up words talking about energy, powerful work that's from God. Back in the... uh, 70s, 80s, there was this campfire song, which was pretty popular. And I sang, I sang it for my wife last night. She doesn't remember it, so it must not been very lasted very long. <laughs> it was based on uh, Colossians 1.27 and uh, Galatians 2.20. Christ in me. It is no longer me that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. It is no longer me that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. And we sang that at least in my recollection, we sang it quite a bit in youth ministry. And I remember I was at one of those trainings. I've never told this story here. I've been saving it for like 30 years, I guess. <laughs> um, and the seminar leader at one of those trainings at Moody Bible Institute was a youth pastor named Dave Schaefer. He was the trainer. And he told a story about when he was a youth pastor in a suburb of New York City. And he organized a youth trip retreat uh, was a bike trip. I, ben, I don't, I don't think our kids would go for this nowadays, but 140-mile bike trip retreat from the edge of New York City to the far east end of Long Island. And now this guy, he, he said, I hate bike trips, but they were such a great means of ministry, we would do them. It was good for the youth group, it was kind of a retreat. So the students had all gotten their directions about, you need to kind of be in shape, You know, try to work on this. And have your bikes well-maintained before we take off. And all the details were in place, and the day arrived. And so they're they're heading in. By the way, and he brought in a friend who's going to be the the youth, uh, the weekend speaker in the evening around wherever they were stopping. So they're going east from the city, and it is bad. He hardly goes a mile without having to stop and help some kid fix their bike. It's hot, summertime. Kids are, not just doing, are just not doing well. And so he's riding along, getting more and more angry. And he's venting more and more at God as he goes. And by lunchtime, he's only gone 10 miles. First day is only 35 miles. It's the easy day. He's only gone 10 miles. They're going to make it easy so they get in shape, you know. So um, he's way behind. He's fixed seven or eight tires for individual kids. <laughs> And he is steaming. Everybody's past him from his youth. All the leaders, except for the guest speaker for the weekend. He's back there somewhere. His name was Dave also. So now he starts worrying about him. He's a little older, like 36. (laughs) And he hasn't never done this kind of activity. And the the problem is, um, he's kind of overweight. Actually, he's obese. 140-mile bike trip. So now Schaefer is getting really hot. God, why did I have to be a youth pastor? Why are we on this stupid bike trip? And where's Dave? And he starts imagining Dave lying on the side of the road, dead of a heart attack. And now he's really frustrated. God, you've gone and killed my buddy Dave. So he's riding along with all these angry thoughts. They're building up inside of him. And he comes over the hill. At the bottom of the hill is one of the sweetest girls in the youth group flagging him down. Oh, Schaefer, I'm so glad you came along. I'm having some problems. Could you please help me out? Oh, sure, Cindy, he's thinking. And he is steaming and saying, Dear Lord, here's another silly kid. Why did she have to come on this bike trip? Why is she in the youth group? Why couldn't she take care of her own bike? He helps her fix the bike while she sweetly praises and thanks Jesus that he came by. And muttering in his, whole, in his spirit the whole time, but she's so nice, he can't get mad at her. And meanwhile, Dave still hasn't caught up. Now he's really worried. And just as they get the bike fixed, they see someone come on over the last hill they've just been over. And sure enough, as they wait for him, they see Dave hanging, over, hanging all over his back. I mean, literally 
hanging all over his bike. And as he gets closer, they can hear he's singing something. And as he gets closer yet, they can make out the words. It is no longer me that rideth, but Christ that rideth in me. Over and over and over. And it hits Schaefer. Here is this big fat man who has no business being on a trip like this much less has the capacity to even sing. But he's found the key. And he's singing away to the rhythm of his thighs, <laughs> slapping together every time he pedals. It is Christ that rideth in me. And he and Cindy hopped on their bikes, and they sang with him all the way to the evening stop. That's the commission. To make disciples of Jesus Christ who live the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And Jesus said, apart from me, you can't do it. But the implication is, in Christ, we all can do everything he's called us to do. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this timeless, simple truth, yet so complicated to live out and to grow into understanding and deeper maturity. Thank you for the call that you've laid on not only Ben and other pastors, but you've laid on every one of us to be disciple-making uh, leaders, people, mentors, whose goal is to present other people perfect in Christ as we live out that principle of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Uh, make us faithful. Uh, bless us as we minister together with Ben and other leaders and teams and groups in our church that we would be faithful to that calling of living out the fact that you are in us, living in us and through us every day. In Jesus' name we pray.